Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you for your great talk. Um, okay, I'm a little nervous. I get nervous when I <laughs> give a talk, so let me hold my water first. Uh, well, my uh, the title of the talk uh, I will give today is uh, New Wars and Autonomous Self-Defense. Uh, but I have shifted uh, a little bit my focus. I'm not going to focus on Rojava uh, because of the recent developments in Turkey. Uh, it will still uh, concern the Kurdish question and it will give reference to Rojava, but it will, uh, the uh, context will unfold uh, within Turkey and the larger Middle East. So it's not going to be exclusively on Rojava. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read the talk. <laughs> uh, a number of scholars working in the field of geography, sociology, and political science have developed the concept of new wars to talk about the state we are living in in the last two decades. These scholars claim that currently we are going through a fourth world war that is, of course, if we would call the Cold War a Third World War, and argue that after the collapse of the Soviet bloc, the politics of controlled conflict and tension has been replaced by continuous, scattered, and extending small wars whose sides are multiple and whose outcome remain uncertain. In this talk, first, I will co address this concept of new wars, I will explain how both a biopolit biopolitical and a necropolitical logic underline these wars and transform war into a permanent state of affairs. Second, I will discuss how Kurds and women in part, uh, sorry, second, I will discuss how Turkey is increasingly becoming a playground for these new wars and how Kurds and women in particular are being targeted by both the Turkish state and the Islamic state, ISIS, Ishid, Daesh, transforming Kurdish and women's public and private lives into spaces of death and violence. Finally, I will talk about the concept of autonomous self-defense as developed by the Kurdish liberation movement to, uh, to counter such attacks. Autonomous self-government and self-defense are hotly debated issues among oppositional circles in Turkey, especially in the aftermath of the Gezi events and the Rojava experience in Syria. Many cities in the southeast of Turkey, that is northern Kurdistan, have declared autonomous governments and created self-defense structures in the last couple of months and have in turn came under state attack as a result of which more than 100 civilians were killed. Let's start with the concept of new wars. The concept of new wars refers to two different forms of conflict in contemporary world. The first of these is best exemplified by the US invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, but is also asso associated with Israel's occupation of Palestine and Turkey's policies in northern Kurdistan. Such wars encompass both soft and hard power, they have popular support, and their is, characteristic is that they will be continuous and relentless until an abstract goal such as ending terrorism, bringing democracy, or ensuring security is achieved. The second type of war that the concept of new wars refer to is rooted on the one hand in the wars of Eastern Europe, to be specific in former Yugoslavia, and on the other hand in the multiple civil wars of Africa. This second type of war is typically led by paramilitary groups that flourish once the central state loses, its pow loses power, and such wars are often genocidal. While global powers and capital also play a role in shaping these genocidal wars and the actions of those who, play a, uh, who wage them, most of the time alliances on the field remain temporary and enemies are changing. Indeed, even in the first type of new wars, alliances are temporary and enemies are changing, 
as we have, for example, witnessed in Iraq. Therefore, scholars, when categorizing these wars, take as their criteria the form and logic of the war rather than, than the actors who wage them. I will follow their categorization and call the first type of war biopolitical and the second one necropolitical. Before explaining this, let me also say that both state and non-state organizations exercise biopolitics and necropolitics, despite the fact that the former is mostly associated with states and the latter with non-states in the literature. Okay, what is a biopolitical war? Biopolitical wars are those hybrid wars which are fought in the name of life and making life. We can also call them liberal wars since they are given meaning by discourses of democracy, security, and peace. So, for example, the US intervenes for the sake of democracy, Israel kills in the name of security, and Turkey declares curfew and brings special teams, special uh, military teams, to Kurdish towns for the sake of, sake of social peace. Such biopolitical wars that have been spreading since the Soviet collapse and effectively made their mark all around the world have become the ordinary state of affairs with liberalisms and capitalism's declaration of themselves as the only representatives of humanity and ethics. Biopolitical war targets populations deep different and dangerous to humanity, but also always imply that such populations have the potential of being corrected, converted, assimilated, and cleansed. In general, we can identify five characteristics of these wars. First, and I have already discussed this characteristic, they aim at depoliticizing war and public sphere by attributing theological and teleological meanings to war, such as humanitarianism, democracy, peace, unity, or security. Second, war is permanent and unending, and its forms are fronts are ever enlarging. Different from past war wars, negotiations or treaties cannot bring an end to these wars, and all people, regions, cities, as long as they remain inassimilable, inassimilable, inassimilable <laughs> to the liberal and capitalist world and incommensurable with its values can be a target of these wars because they are regarded to be a danger to the health and security of humanity. Third, since these are wars whose political meaning are emptied out, Old concepts such as mar martyrdom or heroism for the nation make no sense in their context. Death of soldiers in faraway lands who fight the good liberal war cannot be easily valorized since the war, war is fought for life in order to make live. As such, the goal becomes that the human cost of waging them will be minimized. Accordingly, technology, special teams, contracted soldiers, replace armies in such wars. Fourth, new wars take place in urban places, in cities and other populated areas, destroying the unhealthy elements of the population and winning the hearts of those who have not yet been infected by the epidemic of, let's say, terrorism, become complementary goals. During biopolitical wars, siege, quarantine, and isolation, along with social policy, policies, granting of selective social rights, and selective punishments are employed as counterinsurgency strategies. Violent means are also hybrid, ranging from tear gas to drone attacks. Finally, these wars are fought at the representational level, as much as on the field, and the consent and consenting spectators must be actively produced who see a personal stake in war. People at home must believe that the multiple native deaths produced in faraway wars 
are for their own good and help them to continue their lifestyles and moral high ground. As I have mentioned earlier, such wars have no ending and no particular accessible, identifiable enemy. Peace in my, such wars is a continuation of war with other means. Peace aims at neutralizing opposition, at opening up the spaces ma made uncanny by war to capital investment, at restoring state power and its law, and at producing security regimes by delegating power to police and to bureaucrats who primarily work as the guardians of the regime. Needless to say, such wars are also closely related with capitalist, linked to capitalist development. People who are targets of biopolitical warfare are used as cheap labor during peacetime and taken out of the labor market violently when there is no more need for them. Investment in military industry vitalizes economies. Building military safe zones around natural resources legitimizes primitive accumulation with the help of local collaborators and, and dispossesses economic actors seen to be an impediment to neoliberal restructuring of economies. Finally, permanent war prevents populations from demanding social rights, especially when the state needs to cut its social expenses. Okay, these are the logic of biopolitical war. How about necropolitical wars? On the other side of the new wars coin is the necropolitical logic whose, calculative, uh, whose calculation, uh, well, whose cal okay. On the other side of the new wars coin is necropolitics, whose calculative logic demands death, devastation, and des destitution. Here, war is not fought in the name of life. On the contrary, it aims at producing dead bodies, limbs, wounds, injuries. The concept necropolitical has been made popular by the anthropolo anthropologist Achille Membe when he put it forth to describe the African situation during the 2000s. However, today, Syria and the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq became the symbols of necro necropolitics and have brought necropolitical wars into a whole new plane. <coughs> According to Membe, necropolitical wars are waged by non-state organizations and paramilitaries that are formed as a result of the weakening of nation states by economic and political globalization. <coughs> as states lose their capacity to control trade routes and to monopolize means of violence, and as they fail to maintain any kind of productive relationship with their citizens, through social rights and state employment, non-state organizations with vague ideologies but powerful narratives of victimization and avenge flourish around natural resources and penetrable, penetrable bound, uh, borders. Moreover, examples of Ukraine, Africa, South Asia, <laughs> and the Middle East show that such, such organizations are neither temporary nor exceptional, but become part of the contem contemporary global war order. Necropolitical wars also have a com have few common characteristics. First of all, necropolitical wars are genocidal wars that aim at annihilating populations and at freeing spaces from unwanted ethnic, religious, or racial enemies to make these spaces available for plunder first and for re-territorialization later. Second, no, these, the non-state organizations that wage necropolitical wars show hedonistic qualities and operate in an expenditure economy. Spending, murder, rape, 
and the suicidal and murderous drive orient their actions and desires. In necropolitical wars, transgression of norms and extreme forms of violence become means to enter the historical stage for specifically young men who have been kept at the fringes of the global economy and politics. Here as well, the war is unending. It becomes a permanent state from which honor and meaning is derived. The famous sociologist Sigmund Bauman says, those who wage necropolitical wars see themselves as warriors and as raiders for whom the whole world has become a frontier. We should also add that they are, these people are traders of sorts who make their revenue from natural resources. The Islamic State, of course, brought a whole new dimension to this by selling archaeological relics that they gathered from cities whose destruction they turned into a public spectacle. Just like biopolitical wars, necropolitical wars are also wars waged on the representational level. Baudrillard had once declared that the medium of television prevented the Western public from ever recognizing the Gulf War for what it is, an atrocity with deadly con consequences on the field. The Islamic State descends from Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda, one could safely argue, has both a historical and visual geneolo genealogy to be traced from the Iraqi war. The Islamic State places great emphasis on using the electronic media as one of its war tactics. Instead of hiding atrocity, electronic media allows the IS to multiply and accentuate it. It uses Twitter and Facebook, allegedly also video games, to, for recruitment, videos its combatants, and most significantly, documents and disseminates its shootings, assassinations, and decapitations. Indeed, a double process of fetishizing and defetishizing occurred during necropolitical wars. While means of violence are profaned and made available to an increasing number of men for use, violence is transformed into a spectacle, into a fetish that orients desire, produces meaning, and helps for recruitment. Finally, apart from death, image, and territory, necropolitical wars also produce migrants. Such migrants are integrated to the global economy negatively as recipients of humanitarian assistance, residents of refugee camps, as seekers of asylum, and as objects of human trafficking. A vast informal and global economy develops around them, as their bodies and organs become available for sale and buy. Migrants' bodies are repo repository of raw material instead of labor, and capitalist exploitation and slavery meets once again in the new economies of war and refuge. Well, what does that have anything to do with Turkey? Well, I argue that in the last decade, Turkey has, or, well, let me just take a step back. In the last decade, Turkey had already become a ground of biopolitical warfare waged against a number of different groups, including Kurds, Alevis, and women. Both hard power and soft power targeted them and interfered in their lives for the sake of peace, development, morality and security using multiple means. Let me give just a few examples. Neighborhoods in big cities where Alevis live, lived were brought under strict police control and also became objects of urban reconstruction projects. Kurdish cities were populated with special security forces and police stations. Alongside these were extending social assistance programs and conditional cash transfers, free health insurance schemes to people who, who passed strict means testing ordeals, and of course public housing projects flourished, causing a debt crisis everywhere. Also, a peace process with the armed guerrilla organization PKK started that aimed, as we now find out, 
at neutralizing opposition and making uncanny spaces secure for capital investment. It attempted to restore state law and create homogeneous Islamic subjects out of the diversity of Kurdish people. Women's bodies, on the other hand, were also targeted by biopolitical power through hybrid means, including new abortion laws, sanctification of motherhood, Islamic morale, labor laws that encouraged part-time, temporal, and flexible labor, and meanwhile, femicide increased everywhere. Through political speeches, women were made responsible for raising a docile and conservative youth, and Alevi and Kurdish women in particular were regularly blamed for fa failing in this endeavor, which was also a basis for legitimizing new anti-terror laws that tar targeted children who participated in political protests. When the peace process collapsed, the state also showed its hard power. Declaring martial law, weeks-long weeks long curfews in Kurdish cities, arresting politicians and killing civilians. The existence of tanks, special teams, tear gas, snipers and drones became quickly a part of everyday life and we have witnessed a war against the living and the dead alike, supposedly in order to create security, democracy, unity and order in the oppositional spaces of Turkey. Unfortunately, but as expected, large numbers of people still give consent to such atrocities. Meanwhile, Turkey has also become a scene for the necropolitics of the IS in Suruç, Diyarbakır and Ankara. A press meeting, an election rally and a peace demonstra demonstration were attacked by the IS suicide bombers, leaving hundreds dead. These suicide bombings also targeted Kurds against whom the IS is waging a war in Syria, Rojava. Now the question becomes, and this is the main question that I want to pose, what happens to populations like Kurds or women or Alevis who become the intersecting targets of biopolitics and necropolitics? To what extent can national or international law protect them? Can they at all? To what extent can notions of citizenship, electoral democracy, or any institution of liberalism address their situation? To what extent can liberal peace processes address issues of security and democracy in such a context? The answers to such questions are complicated. For example, norms of pro peace processes are developed from within a nation state paradigm, whereas Kurds are spread in four different nations in each of which they need to be defended against state violence and now IS violence. Moreover, in a region of irreducible diversity, where the fact that citizenship as a category fails to represent everyone has emerged as an everyday truth, where, as opposed to the West, the liberal imagination of human rights cannot be su sustained, and where the category of the population is also not easily applicable due to continually permeated boundaries and sovereignties. New political imaginations and institutions are necessary. The question is then, how can peace, citizenship, or liberal democracy be performed when they cite norms that have less and less grounding in current reality? As a response to this question, and also in, inspired by the Rojava revolution in Syria, Kurds have, in Turkey have developed the idea and institutions of autonomous self-defense to deal with their situation in the four, na four nation states they live in. I will finish this talk by briefly discussing the con this concept to start a broader debate on how to defend ourselves in the midst of a third Fourth World War, whose grounding is deepening and whose fronts are extending everywhere in the world. The concept of de self-defense, as used by Kurds, has different genealogies. First, it refers to the defense of Kurds against state violence and the role that armed guerrilla and militia will play in its organization. Second, self-defense is a question of how oppressed people in general 
will protect their life worlds against centralization, ecological destruction, patriarchal relations, and capitalism. Finally, it also addresses how societies will produce and reproduce themselves peacefully in the face of a new and high in the face of new and hybrid wars fought by global powers, states, genocidal organizations, and multinationals using violent and nonviolent means. Self-defense, as opposed to the notion of security, involves the democratization of the means of production, reproduction, and violence, and hence implies that social forms should gradually acquire autonomy in processes of decision-making, self-production, and security provision without depending on state structures. Kurds have also developed several method methodologies to realize self-defense here and now without expecting a change in international or national law that would give them the legal space to organize themselves. First, they have started to take arms in the cities they live in to resist arrest and police raids. Second, they have started forming negotiations and alliances and networks with other Kurds and oppressed groups in Turkey. Finally, they have started creating institutions that develop means of self-governance in areas such as decision-making, health provision, and schooling. Kurdish women have also created their own institutions, structures, and networks parallel to these with the recognition that it is not only capitalism and nation states, but also patriarchy that underline today's war ideologies. What is happening in Kurdistan as a result of these de developments is a gradual transformation in all aspects of life, most importantly in space, ethics, and labor. Spaces are transformed into spaces of resistance, negotiation, and self-organization. A new ethics is emerging that foregrounds solidarity, community, friendship, and internationalism. Work of care and work of reproduction of those who resist and transform the system becomes more important than wage labor. People in Kurdistan are convinced that survival, defense, and autonomy have become the same thing, thing and have now the same refer referent in the context they live in. Of course, these developments cre create new problems and new questions that I will not discuss here. As I finish, I must say that in Turkey and in the Middle East, we are going through a very difficult times, specifically as women as and as oppositional subjects. From what I hear and read, I think this is becoming a general state in a lot of other countries. Different groups, communities, and identities are trying to come in terms with the wars shaping our life worlds. A debate on how to defend ourselves and so how to defend ourselves and society based on our different experiences and responses has become more urgent than ever. I hope that this talk has contributed to opening up such a debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nazan Istinda. So we can get actually one question uh, to this panel. If there are any questions, we could, uh, if you want to address, uh, we can get one. Yeah. So it was for Bangui. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait. So, if there are any questions, if for there aren't any questions, then maybe. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I don't. Sorry, when you mention solidarity among Kurds, do you also mean a different group of Kurds? 
You also mean solidarity among Kurds living in different countries, namely Syria, uh, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, or? Yes, actually, I mean, it's a, uh, it, 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 yes. When it comes to the Definitely, one of them is that. They have created, like, I mean, after the uh, peace process, they have uh, organized several conferences and created several umbrella organizations. And uh, that's why I say uh, spaces of, they have created, actively created spaces of negotiation because each of these or, uh, umbrella organizations brings different kinds of people together and they have also an, uh, like negotiation networks between them. Uh, and uh, of course one of them, uh, actually more than one, uh, is uh, about uh, how to build solidarity between especially, of course, Iraqi Kurds and Turkish and uh, Syrian Kurds, because Turkish and Syrian Kurds have, I mean, already uh, I mean, contact and negotiation on the ground, but with Iraqi Kurds it's a little bit different. Mm. Can I ask something, or is it finished? Yes. Well, I think that um, it's a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And I think that it gives, it really gave a sense of the urgency right now, and the, yeah, the urgencies. I had a sense that you were, um, just before speaking about the necessity of self-defense organization, you uh, slightly criticized as something of liberal Western society, an idea of nonviolence in a way, as if it's nice and easy to be nonviolent if you're in Paris, but a little bit more different if you're on the border with Syria right now. And at the same time, as I obviously acknowledge that difference, I would like to raise a bigger, broader question, which is historically more distant than what we are looking at Paris today and Syria today. And that is uh, the question of nonviolence more generally. I mean, in the long run, what happens? I mean, the Gandhi salt marches were done in a context where uh, Indians were being butchered, literally butchered. And yet, Gandhi's position uh, was ultimately successful. So. That's one point, and, and, and that's not Western. <laughs> and the second point is uh, some of the self def claims for self-defense, which I may personally enter into if I were in such a situation, so I'm not, I don't know, you know. But some of them in certain particular places and moments, such as the United States of America in the 50s and 60s, when there was clearly a continuation of slavery in a way, in a post-slavery period, there were theories of self-defense emerging in many groups, um, even, you know, like Black Panther and so on. Um, I'm not sure if that did more than Martin Luther King, you know? I mean, that, that question is a question that traverses not east-west or oppressed and not oppressed. It somehow is a broader philosophical thing that traverses all of the history of humanity, and we e each make our choice. Should I just sure. make a comment? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I criticize definitely the whole uh, non uh, discourse on nonviolence, uh, but based on uh, my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a scholar of violence. Uh, and uh, I think neither uh, most scholars of violence uh, do, or and most philosophers of violence do not pose non-violence in opposition to violence. But when they put something in opposition to violence, it is, for example, politics. It is resistance. It is something else. I mean, it's not non-violence. Non-violence is, I think, uh, uh, an uh, an, impos an invention and a construction, uh, and we can think of, uh, we should think something that is opposite to violence, but that is not non-violent. We should not conceptualize it as non-violence. We should conceptualize it as something different. Uh, but uh, the second thing is, 
uh, I, the examples you are giving are very, uh, and we should, this is a, such a long debate, yeah. and I see that, I recognize that, and th I'm, these are definitely not my fi final words. I know you would have a response to them too, just you know, making my own comment. Uh, the second thing is, I think what is different, uh, I mean, what, what is, uh, with the self-defense concept, what Kurds are saying is not, I mean, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, guerrilla leaders say, or, or Öcalan has said, uh, violence is not anymore about, uh, an, about for a nation state or for, you know, making the state obey, uh, obey our ethnic will. Self-defense is a concept about, I am creating something new, and everybody is going to attack this now. Like the Paris Commune, how are you going to protect? You know, how, how uh, can we protect? Uh, we, we have created something alternative, but that alternative will be attacked by capital, by patriarchy, by how are we going to defend it? And uh, the answer is not, of course, exercising violence, but changing relations of violence, changing the distribution of the means of violence. That would be my answer.